Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us this evening. I'm Kelly Kivlin, a curator at DIA Art Foundation, and I'm thrilled to be joining in this virtual conversation tonight with Carl Craig, joining us from Detroit, and DeForest Brown Jr., who is joining us from New York City. This evening's talk has been planned in conjunction with Craig's Party After Party, a sound installation that opened at DIA Beacon uh, in March of 2020, and will be on view through summer 2021. And as part of the duration of the installation, we plan a year-long cumulative platform of public programs, exploring the, uh, the legacy of techno, and it's titled the Carl Craig Sessions. And this is sort of the kickoff launch event for that. And it, we are hoping that this joins an ongoing and multi-vocal dialogue about techno's emergence in Detroit's underground, but also its continued reverberations worldwide. And also launching today, uh, DIA has planned an online film series that constellates some of the forms, mythologies, and politics present in the greater movement of techno. It's curated by Kirsten May Reed Gill and Devin Malone. And this first screen is available on our website through Sunday evening. And it includes films such as um, Tony Koch's Black Celebration, which is a co-presentation with the Hammer Museum in LA, the Autolith Group's Hydra Decapita, and the documentary Techno City, What is Detroit Techno? Carl Craig is one of the most iconic figures in Detroit Techno. He began his career in the late 1980s as a DJ and producer and soon after came to prominence within the Detroit Techno scene. He's frequently acknowledged as one of the field's most wide ranging artists, integrating inspirations and sounds from a variety of musical genres in his work. With this, he approaches techno less as a genre and more as a philosophy or movement of continued potential. Over the years, he has released several recordings on both his own Planet E um, communications record label and under a number of aliases employed to explore new directions. Craig's commission at DIA, titled again, Party After Party, reflects his experiences as an internationally touring DJ over a career of more than three decades. Reimagining DIA Beacon's lower level this sonic environment is a contemplative, contemplative space, really built on the politics of techno, one of borderlessness and also reclamation, but it is also deeply personal for Craig, and we'll speak to that a little bit later in the talk. DeForest Brown Jr. was born in 1990 in Tampa Bay, Florida, and lives in New York City. He's a music writer, media theorist, and curator, but most, most importantly, he defines himself as a rhythm analyst. Brown's work is concerned with the speculative futures and performance music's intersections with technology and al logarithms, as well as pushing electronic music into ever more radical multimedia presentations. Under the moniker Speaker Music, Brown produces digital audio and extended media. And this past Friday on Juneteenth, he released Black National Sonic Weaponry on Planet Mew Records. He's also representative of the Make, Tech Make Techno Black Again campaign. And now, I've asked Brown to give a short introduction that speaks to his upcoming book, Assembling a Black Counterculture, which will be released uh, this fall by Primary Information. And here comes DeForest. So, hi, I'm DeForest Brown Jr. As Kelly has uh, so nicely laid out prior, I am a rhythm analyst, media theorist, and curator. Um, this fall, I'll be releasing the book Assembling a Black Counterculture, which traces a sort of narrative of the Americas uh, leading up to the founding of the United States um, with the foundation of techno in Detroit in the 1980s as a central point. Um, what I'm most interested in with techno is the sort of intersection in the way that Juan Atkins, who was one half of C Cybertron, sort of... Uh, formulated the the genre but also um we we both came through it through businessman and futurist alvin toffler and his book the third wave um which Juan atkins read in a future studies class in high, in high school and i stumbled across this book in college while studying media theory and um this book more or less uh covers the sort of three uh productive waves of the industrial revolution that um kind of defines the finding of America, the founding of America. So you start with agriculture and development through the plantations of uh, the Deep South. You move your way over to um, the assembly line productions of 
of like the Ford factory and Chrysler factories, and then to today, uh, sort of algorithm algorithm driven and data driven um, like business practices. Yeah, which you see a lot with Amazon and other Silicon Valley companies. Um, I guess moving on to the next slide, if you will. Also, the cover of the book is done by Abdul uh, Kadem Hawk, who is a known uh, artist for within the Detroit techno scene and um, has recently released a graphic novel about the group Drexia. Um, so sorry, next slide. <laughs> um, yeah, so actually these quotes here on the side are uh, two quotes that I'll be using in the first chapter of the book, uh, Techno City, The Final Frontier. That chapter is named after two uh, for me, defining techno tracks, one from Juan Atkins and another from uh, Matt Mike of Underground Resistance, so Techno City and The Final Frontier. Um, what I found interesting about these quotes in relation to the chart over to our left, which is um, from the liner notes of Drexia's The Quest, is the way in which uh, a sort of map of America can kind of explain the way that black people and electronic resources and also the sort of idea or sort of macro idea of both kind of come into alignment. So as you see from 1655 eight through 1867, you have the transatlantic slave trade, which moved West Af African peoples from West Africa over to the, uh, over to the Americas. Um, beyond that, there's a migration up North um, from the 1930s and forties, um, which is when, after, well, after the Civil War and like the South kind of uh, dove into a devastating bankruptcy, a lot of uh, black people decided to migrate up north to find work and to get away from the gruesome crimes of the KKK and other sort of, um, I guess, problematic structures of the Jim Crow laws. And in, in this city is where yeah, techno comes to be. And as you see in the next chart, uh, in 1988, techno leaves Detroit and spreads worldwide. Um, what happened that year is that a compilation was released through, um, through a record label in the UK called Techno, the New, Sound, the New Dance Sound of Detroit, which introduced the European audience to both the word techno and also this uh, sort of gathering of techno artists. So the Bellevue Three, Juan Atkins, Derek May, and Kevin Saunderson, as well as Eddie Folks and other surrounding uh, members of that community. This final slide here, um, or this final sort of panel in the chart, the journey home is a sort of ideation of now that techno has traveled worldwide, the hope from the minds of uh, James Stinson and Gerald Donald was that a sort of uh, unity would be found in the African diasporas. And this is something that uh, the poet and political activist Amiri Baraka would also point to in 1966 um, in his writings about unity, unity music, saying that you cannot separate the soul music of James Brown from the uh, sort of jazz of John Coltrane, Alice Coltrane, Pharaoh Sanders, and so on. Um, and the book, for me, um, kind of offers a platform to, again, lay out the entire history of America and this sort of linear progression of black music and put it like to really really pack it in and kind of show what socioeconomic um both restrictions and advantages allowed for techno to become what i would consider a penultimate uh, american sound um which ultimately was exported to the european uh, states so i guess if we can move on to the next slide <laughs> um, thank you um so this is a mural by uh, Diego Rivera. Um, there's several other panels of this large scale mural that sort of defines uh, the Detroit uh, city and it being what Alvin Toffler considered to be um, a sort of, again, penultimate um, formation of technological and urban progress in the Americas. Um, and. I mean, at the time that Ford was, or all these factories are kind of emerging, you had like the big three, you had Chrysler, uh, Ford, and GMC, these three large companies producing cars, and Detroit was a city built for cars, um, and built for this idea of a future in which you can move quickly between the inner and outer city, and, um, and all sorts of 
I guess, again, like socioeconomic and geographic dynamics kind of emerge when you establish a landscape based on work and based on endless uh, systematic production. Um, okay, next slide. <laughs> um, so eventually there was a crash that happened in Detroit and obviously the race riots of the uh, 70s and the, the utopia that Alvin Toffler had kind of uh, drawn up with drawn up in his book, but also was like represented in the actual building of Detroit, kind of came to an end and and that's where this group on the ground resistance comes in. I, I think about them a lot as a sort of um, immediate rebuttal to the utopia that the original three techno musicians were kind of, uh, I'll, I'll say introduced to, maybe interacted with, but um, Matt Mike of Underground Resistance, uh, he's been known to kind of talk about the idea of being a child and seeing the tanks driving down the streets and seeing scenes that are quite similar to what we are seeing today with the protests for Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmaud Aubrey, and the countless other names of black people that have been harmed by the police and killed by the police. Um, and a lot of the book for me is wanting to reestablish techno as not necessarily a protest music, but a kind of protest music, but also as a sort of music that is born out of, again, socioeconomic uh, systemic conditions and also kind of offering a way for what at the time Juan Atkins was like 19, it, what was a way for a 19 year old black kid to imagine something much larger than what was in front of him to imagine something, a, a utopia that worked, if you will. Um, and so I guess kind of speeding all the way up to today, um, I actually, first came into contact with Carl's music in, in college after I really dug into the book, The Third Wave, and began listening and kind of just gobbling up as much techno as I could. Um, and this quote that Dia has been using to promote the event that comes from Tony Coates's uh, Black Celebration uh, was a statement that Derek May had made to journalist Stuart Cosgrove when he was working on the liner notes for the techno compilation that would, again, officially stamp the name and uh, propagate the name techno to the, the world proper. Um, <laughs> yeah. So bringing this to Carl, and actually this quote is from um, Microhouse. Um, or oh, it's Microhouse. Atlantic, yeah, another <laughs> Black Atlantic of Tony Coke. So, um, and we we wanted to bring attention to this quote very much for the reasons that DeForest just pointed out. Um, but also because of um, um, something that Carl has been working on through his entire career, really, is to trace and, and chart um, the history of techno. And this is actually a tweet by Carl that speaks, you know, sort of pointedly at that. And um, I think this is a good place for us to begin our conversation. Um, so welcome, Carl. And thank you, DeForest. Um, so Carl, we, I would, I'd be really interested just look, hearing what DeForest just laid out and, and um, what he's working on in terms of his research for his book. How did those, you know, it would be great to learn more about your formative years growing up in Detroit, how that the social political aspects of the city had influence on you as well as those um, in the early part of the scene. One one correction I want to make sure yeah. uh, is that the riots happened in 1967. Yeah. Seven, yeah. Yeah, so that's very important because <laughs> when I grew up in the 70s, there were no riots. So, um, 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 some of some of the things that that really um, one thing that that photo from from uh, the Detroit Institute of Arts of Diego Rivera's piece is a big influence on me and I think on most of us uh, that live in Detroit and, and that that made music in in, uh, in Detroit because we can go there and we can see this wonderful mural that um, that's a, a, not only a representation of of uh, Detroit but also a tribute to 
uh, to the workers of Detroit. And it's it's uh, um, an amazing piece. I just I'm just looking at this right now. I just really really love it. Um, so um, I never had any experiences, of course, um, with with um, the the effect of the riot, only the after effects of of the riots. And then, you know, we have have um, a very uh, important part of of uh, Detroit life and and probably of of life of African Americans in the U.S. that that we are always told stories. We're always like Griot, you know, kind of thing. We're always reminded of, of what happened and, and we wear things on our sleeves about it. So, um, so by the riots, by, um, what do they call it? The big, the big 10 or big five, I think it was Detroit police officers that were brutalizing, um, uh, that were brutalizing people in the late sixties, early seventies. Um, you know the changes in the city, the the increase of of um, uh, the the white flight, but then the increase of business that came in uh, from from uh, Iraq uh, from Iraq, I think from Chaldeans that were coming in that were taking over um, uh, gas stations and and party stores and things like that, and the struggles that Detroit had in order to you know stay alive. I mean, Coleman Coleman Young was was a real big influence on you know all of us uh that i know that are doing music all the guys that are around my age that are uh, african-american that are doing this music because he was the guy who was saying um you know we don't need you we don't need the suburbs you know go away you know we can we can do this ourselves he came in and he was militant and that's you see that in underground resistance you know, in spades. I mean, you see it in, in, in Kenny Dixon, you know, you see it in, in um, uh, I mean, Derek is, is, you know, he could, could be Coleman Young in some cases, you know? So, so there, there's always these connections that, that um, I make and I think that have to be made and have to be remembered because it's very easy for new generations of people to come in and, and uh, work to dominate electronic music and especially learn or work to dominate uh, techno music and call it their own, whether they're from Belgium or Holland or Germany or England or, or uh, anywhere, you know, but it's necessary to always have somebody that's, that's sticking it out there because, you know, right now it's, it's very in vogue to say techno is black music for a lot of people online, especially after this, this, uh, um, these riots and things that have been going on. And, you know, you started uh, the make techno black again thing. Thank you very much. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, I feel that it's important to make these statements like this one where, you know, this is really a chart <laughs> that mm -hmm. goes from, uh, it circles, it starts in Detroit mm -hmm. and it ends in Detroit, you know? Mm -hmm. um, in the same way that music has traveled uh, the world in, in, um, in such ways like rock and roll, you know, when it started as, as uh, the blues and consider race music and only for blacks to listen to. And then, you know, once, once uh, the Stones and, and uh, Eric Clapton and, and the Beatles and those guys got their hands on it and then put it into their music and came back, you know, people here were surprised that the music came from, you know, black, uh, black music. Uh, in, in the U.S. And, and it opened up the doors for that music to be heard more. And it just kept going back and forth, going back and forth, you know. And we needed, I needed to, to show that circle that happened with Detroit going through soul music and R&B and then through disco with Leonard Jackson, then Kraftwerk, then Cybertron, then Juan Atkins. So we're right back in Detroit again. I was really happy to see this chart. Um come up actually when, when you posted it. You also mentioned, yeah, you also mentioned the, the griot tradition um, a bit earlier, which is, I think, really important to something like this chart um, in regards to 
I guess the kind of, would you call them uh, a proto MC that would be paid to kind of tell the entire story of a tribe and kind of spill it all out in one go. Okay. Um, yeah, and that's something that I'm trying to do with the book, right? Is like assembling, I've actually been using your chart as a, as a assembly line to like tell this story. Um, and I, I think a lot about this quote from Derek May quite recently where he talks about how techno was never about the electronics, it was about the people and the city itself and the people touching the gear. Mm -hmm. um, which I think is something that's oftentimes lost in the, the larger conversation about this music is that, sure, a lot of Japanese electronics were sort of imported in it, and was because of the white flight, a lot of people, like Juan Atkins was able to get a Korg at MS-10 and actually touch this this advanced technology and make a kind of expressive sound that was only really accessible inside of the studios of Motown and, and like over the GRM studios in France and so on and so forth. But and, and there, that's, I mean, the, the technology is what so many people um, just, they, they use as a, as, as a crutch right now, because mm -hmm. it's always about, you know, and it, and it was that way too, when I was starting, um, mm -hmm. people thought that to make techno, you had to have an 808, a 909, and, uh, and a mirage. You know what those and a, are for the you know. for the group listening. Nato so these these are these are uh, synthesizers and drum machines um, that uh, that were used prominently with uh, work from Juan Atkins and and uh, Derek May and uh, Kevin Saunderson as they were creating the, the sound uh, the techno sound Detroit techno sound um, and as you said with Derek what Derek said is not about the tools, it's about, you know, the people utilizing the tools. And with with um, technology and how technology actually um, uh, loses value, that's what made it even more possible for guys in Chicago to get these instruments and, and, uh, uh, and make Chicago house music as well, because, you know, they, we all went to pawn shops, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, we all went to try to get the, the, the clean out sales at the, at the music stores and stuff to get, to get these, these pieces. So, you know, to get a 909 at a cheap price was like getting a Fender Stratocaster guitar, you know, mm -hmm. at a cheap price, you know, for people who, who wanted to play guitar. And that's what the drum machines and the synthesizers were to us were, those were our guitars, our basses, our, you know, our pianos, our, our, uh, um, our spoons and maracas, you know, that's what, mm -hmm. that's, that's what, what we used in order to, uh, to make our, our music, you know? I'm, yeah, one of the things I found interesting about Toffler's book in relation to Juan Atkins is that and I didn't mention this before, is that techno is actually a prefix to the word technocracy, which is a kind of um, society or government run by technical experts. So in the case of what Carl is referring to with this electronic instrument, it's, it's an organizational system for people that can build these instruments and can use these instruments with a level of um, virtuosity that I mean, I guess, again, that it would not be expected of 19-year-old Black kids um, anywhere um, just because of access to, again, to gear and, like, high technical equipment. Um, but I wanted to know how that sort of, or how your introduction to this instrument, to these instruments informed your making of the album Land Cruising, which we can, which, whose album cover we can see right here. Like, the first track is called, like, Mind of a Machine, and, like, I was really taken aback uh, the first time I heard it because, as I mentioned to you earlier, it, it starts with like the sound of an engine. So you have the the idea of this techno car city Detroit kind of enveloping you, and like it's really in the headphones. Um, how did you come about like making that? Um, well, when you the car was was uh, uh, maybe a, a nod or an ode to Kraftwerk Autobahn. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, I still am a big Kraftwerk fan. So um, it starts out with 
that old to Autobahn, but also that is saying this is a Detroit record. You know, this is a car. This record comes from where cars are made. You know, and you can see with the with the uh, a cover that the Land Cruising looks like it could be an insignia on the back of a car. You know, um, and then as the strings are are slowly coming in that's that suspense that you get with motown records papa was a rolling stone you know uh the the productions from norman whitfield um so there i don't know if i psychologically was thinking that i was making that to sound like you know uh or to give a nod to norman whitfield but that's exactly how it turned out. And, you know, when I think about it now, it's like, yeah, that's like Papa was Rolling Stone. But when you get into the bulk of the track, it, it gets very regimented. Um, it's, it's, uh, uh, I used to work at a place where I Xerox copied all day. That's all I did was I Xerox copied. And if I wasn't Xerox copying, I was, stapling papers together and there's a rhythm that you get from from uh doing that all day and it's the rhythm of the machine mm. of the machine so i think we had two or three big xerox copiers with um with uh sorters on them so you know the paper goes chuff, 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 you know and you just hear that all day and you start hearing grooves and and rhythms that are outside of the rhythms and start making things in your head that that go and uh and that mind of a machine is is uh, very much um a play from my experiences being a, a copy shop employee hmm. yeah yeah that's something i've been or that is a kind of description i've encountered a number of times when talking to like techno musicians uh cornelius from underground resistance is mentioned before that the idea of picking cotton and like required a kind of communal rhythm amongst multiple people in a line and that later got optimized by um by uh, eli whitney but the cotton gen so you have a literal transition of like people workers to machine workers and that happens yet again in the ford and or the car industry where you have people working in assembly lines putting together cars again in this rhythm and eventually replaced by machines that can do them at a faster rate um and it's funny, I actually, we switched to the, the side of uh, paperclip people, and I, I feel like there may be some connection there, but I'm I not... was wondering the same, but maybe Carl will illuminate. Yeah, what's this, what's going on here? What are these secret tapes? It's not about the cotton gin, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I, wait, I was going to ask, um, you know, part of what you, you know, the, the early influences is, of course, this rhythm and the machine. But, um, you know, you were talking, Carl, uh, a little bit about, you know, land cruising and we were talking earlier today even about some of these other albums, of course, Paper Put People, more songs and the Detroit Experiment. And I, I really would love to learn a little bit more about the greater influences that you're bringing in. Um, of course, it speaks to that earlier quote, that earlier tweet that we saw, but, um, you know, I think that's what you're so well known for is bringing in all of these influences into each of one of your albums. How did that change over the years or how did, what sort of was your inspiration in giving certain attention to various artists, for instance, with this uh, in the early 2000s with the Detroit Experiment? Um, my, my direct influence was always Detroit. It's always been Detroit. Even when I lived in London making music, sure. it, it was always Detroit. And um, the important, the most important thing maybe to me musically was the exposure of music through radio. And radio in the in the seventies, um, you know, it's it's typecast like with WKRP in Cincinnati, the television show. I don't know if any of you remember that, but, um, uh, you know, the daytime guys is type 
podcast is daytime guys that are like, hey 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 you know hey we're selling this uh, hey, you're listening to uh, uh, uh. and then a nighttime guy who was venus flytrap was like real cool and real mellow and he played like like really good music like during the day the music was candy pop or whatever and during the night it was really good music was it like and quiet storm it like quiet storm yes yeah, yeah. like quiet storm um but our nighttime dj the electrify mojo um not only play cool music he played awesome music so he was the epitome of what black music was because black music we could adopt you know that um fleetwood mac rumors album as a black record <laughs> you know and that's the same thing that we did with craft work uh computer world we adopted that as being black music as well as um parliament funkadelic you know as well as um uh, temptations as well as as any any of the the other amazing music that came from from black culture cameo and and barquets and and uh um just so much stuff so so the radio was was so influential to me to make other styles of music instead of just locking myself into one form of music, techno music. So people want to typecast me as a techno techno musician, but my history goes so much deeper than that because of radio. Mm -hmm. We also had a jazz radio in Detroit, WJZZ, and that's where I'm sure I first heard Marcus Belgrave and Wendell Harrison and, and Bill Randlin and you know these Detroit tribe legends. I'm sure I heard them first there. Uh, as well as hearing, you know, music from Diodato and from Herbie and from Miles and from, you know, every every scope of it. I don't think they played any uh, any Ornette Coleman or anything like that, but any any scope of of uh, I mean, good lord, Donald Byrd, the Blackbirds, all day long, you know. So for me to do an album like Detroit Experiment is it was a no brainer. It was a complete no-brainer for me. Um, um, uh, my mentor, um, Francisco Moore Catlett, uh, he, you know, turned me on to so much music. He plays on the album as well as as he was involved in his own orchestra project, and you know, um, just the the influence from him, his experiences with being a, a drummer in the in the Sunrise Orchestra. Um, you know, it it just all came together for me to um, not have any issue with taking on a project as grandiose as the Detroit uh, experiment. Yeah, what was going on then? Because I mean, at this at this point, you had released like what four or five classic albums throughout the '90s, and it just. I think it's kind of interesting that after more songs about food and revolution, paperclip people, and so on, mm -hmm. you kind of start as Kelly's saying, or you start like assimilating and introducing like new voices in. Um, we were talking a bit about Bowtown um, earlier and the sort of the manufacturing of like of good, potent soul music. And is that something that you think you were trying to do at the time? Was that like kind of going beyond yourself or? Right. Well, um, Juan Atkins had made a statement and I don't, I don't remember the exact quote, but basically that he wasn't trying to be uh, um, Barry Gordy. Yeah. that wasn't his that wasn't his objective and for for me that wasn't my objective either uh, even though i started a label production company you know have a, um, a booking agency that kind of stuff it was never to be uh barry gordy but the quality level the quality level of the music that came from from motown uh definitely is in the forefront of of my mind and uh has a huge influence on me um you know uh, stevie wonder has a huge influence on electronic music techno music house music any type of electronic music that uh that loves to love stevie wonder so you know the quality 
of of his his uh records the quality of of uh uh marvin gaye's records um mm-hmm. a song like quiet storm from um from Smokey robinson i mean you listen to it and it's just like it's a beauty that's there as well as a very high standard of of sound uh engineering and uh, uh it it definitely is in me and and um you know i don't want to throw it away i want to delve into it more mm-hmm. um i i want to turn our attention actually to your installation carl at dia beacon um and actually it before us i was reading a quote by you um that talks about club culture um being sort of this open zone that reimagines um different types of political boundaries. And I think that's really present in the work of Party and After Party, Mm -hmm. um, which Carl, you worked on for five, five years, I think. Years, yes. Years, many, many, many years. (laughs) Many years, thank you, Kelly. Uh, Yeah, well, it was well worth it, I have to say. (laughs) But, you know, it's, I I think it, you know, thinking about the forest's quote rather as a sort of open zone. This is a vast space that you had to think about and con- try to conceive within for many years, um, and um, it does operate uh, and and does sort of challenge different types of political boundaries um, in various ways, um, which we can get to that. But I wanted to first ask for those that are listening to us now, if you can just share a little bit about how you approached this vast space, both sonically and visually, um, maybe you can bring a little insight into your thinking over the years um, for those that haven't yet experienced it. Mm, okay. Um, when when we first started uh, discussing the project and I saw the uh, the space, I mean, it's a huge space and it's daunting. <laughs> you know, 30,000, 40,000 square feet, or is it more than that? It's, it's about that. I, it, mm, I have to do the math. Give me a second. That's okay. Don't worry. About <laughs> it. <laughs> but um, so that amount of space. Uh, I think it's 35,000. Sorry. Yeah, it's, it's something it's, around there. It's a really vast space. And. Um, when when I walk into it, um, I thought of it like a warehouse party, like a rave that you would throw in a warehouse. That's when I first came through and really saw it. And, you know, and I'm thinking about how to separate the room and 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 how to control the room because the the uh, echo time of of uh, a voice is is just so long you know let alone the echo time of a snare drum or or uh the amount of time that that it takes a sine wave to go from one side of the room to the other mm-hmm. so so it was always daunting in that in that sense but you know over the time that uh that i came to visit and then that we discussed um the possibilities of the room it became more uh obvious that we could use the room as itself without the separation and it uh played into how uh how my experiences are on the road as well as with um with uh uh my problems with tinnitus and how you can feel alone with tinnitus after uh you know playing at a club of extremely loud music going back to the hotel all you have on the tv is cnn and the ringing of your ears Mm -hmm. and um i think kelly you you helped me to realize that we could uh use the space without uh separating it and into without me dissecting it and making it into pieces uh so thank you very much because that's great that (laughs) that we got to this point and um yeah so uh you can be in a small room and feel lonely you can be in this large room and feel completely alone and the way the lights are are uh, sequenced and the way the sound is sequenced even with people in the room i think that it gives uh, a clear um feeling of that 
loneliness that you can be with with in yourself during the after party segment mm -hmm. the party segment itself is based more around being in the club and when i first saw the space and saw the windows the first thing that came to mind was a club that i, I love to death in berlin called panorama bar and uh how they use light uh natural light in order to uh, add uh, impact to uh, the feeling of a of a song or the the um, the uh, the peak of a of a song, and uh, with with um, automated shutters, uh, we have recreated that feeling. And, you know, I think it's, it's quite amazing. So when you, if you see some of the people who've posted a uh, video of the piece uh, during the, the opening, um, when the shutters open, people responded by yelling or cheering or dancing or, or doing whatever uh, that is. And that really is the reason why the, uh, the party uh, was designed and, and why it ended up working so well. Well, maybe we can end you here on the X, if you don't mind. Um, because I think sweet it represents spot. the sweet spot. It's yeah. the sweet spot sonically, um, but it, it also is potential for agency, right? There's, you place yourself here and you're in the center of this vast room. Um, so I guess I want to end by asking you before we take questions from the group um, of those joining us, how you both envision agency um, within club culture, how, how especially those um, people of color, I should ask more specifically, what is that agency? What are those possibilities that you see that maybe the early techno artists envisioned um, and how does that differ from maybe today or maybe it's the same? I would say as a club consumer, as a person who goes to, to clubs, there's not a lot of agency for black bodies, whether it's getting through the guard at the door, whether it goes through uh, decent service within the clubs. I mean, I was work, I worked at, at Mixmag as an editor and worked at several different um, music magazines throughout the electronic music industry. And there's actually a vast, um, how should I put it? A vast lack of diversity and a almost like purposeful one um and so i'll say that as a worker in the industry and also as a consumer there is no agency but i found a lot of agency once i started writing about it independently mm -hmm. um so publishing the book but also having conversations like these with the great carl craig um but also through performing this music i found that once i was able to touch this gear myself and to use all the things that I had learned about this music from like receiving press releases, working with artists, writing about the artists, to put what I knew into these machines into a room full of people, I gained a new kind of agency um, that this X and the, uh, the sweet spot seems to almost kind of offer as well. Um, and yeah, I don't know if as a producer, as an artist, Carl, if you feel agency, if that X spot is for you as like a producer, um, but that's, kind of what I found. Well, we all have to find our sweet spot. Mm -hmm. And not everybody can find their sweet spot. So that's a that's an aid in order uh, to find what I defined as a sweet spot for the for the place, but uh, will probably influence people to find their own sweet spots in, in, uh, in their own way. I mean, Miles would turn around and play uh, play at the back wall, band. right? Yeah. Play to his band, yeah. Yeah. So we're getting some <laughs> questions in. This one actually is from Pedro, and it touches on my hometown. Um, are you influenced by Frankie Knuckles, Carl? That's to who, me? Yeah, that's to you. Well, maybe oh. to both of you, actually. I, I should say <laughs> to both of you, rather. Sorry. <laughs> okay, well, well, I'll start off with that. Um, yeah, uh, Frankie Knuckles was was a huge influence. Um, but the, the thing about Frankie Knuckles is that he um, he only made a few records. 
he didn't make a whole lot of records. He did some remixes over time, and I think later in his in his career, he did a lot more uh, work. He had the whistle song that was a big big song in the '90s, I believe. Um, but you know, to it was always a legend, Frankie Knuckles. Um, mm -hmm. I think even because uh, our love was it our love, or or it was it was uh, one of the records that he had that was a, a big record um, that I first heard of as his, as it being a Frankie Knuckles record. I heard in London, but before that, it wasn't a Frankie Knuckles record. It was from. Um, uh, from another guy, uh, I can't remember what his what his name is right now. So it was I was very confused by it, but um, but the legacy that Frankie Knuckles has is is his reputation is for quality for uh, for uh, his his abilities is, is uh, second to none. Agreed, uh, DeForest. You want to answer that? And I Oh, sure. More. Yeah. The way that I look at it is like, I don't really get much of a choice. I, I take all of the great black musicians as one whole family. I mean, that's what I really loved about your tweet on May 9th, Carl, is that you created a really succinct timeline. And I mean, I recently found out in an inter oh, I think it was like a 1989 interview with one Atkins that Derek May had actually sold Frankie Knuckles a, a drum machine that had originally been owned by one and that kind of exchange of gear that exchange that cultural exchange across regional lines so from chicago or detroit to chicago and back and forth that's that's what i find interesting it's it's the person but it's also where he fits within this larger this larger narrative um so yeah Juan did not own that 909 oh he didn't own it no 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 well um, he was pretty mad about it no he <laughs> He the story is is that <laughs> that he told Derek that he shouldn't sell his sound mm -hmm. because Juan didn't really use 909. Juan used 808, mm -hmm. and I think Derek had um, he had two 909s, and he wanted mm -hmm. to sell one to Juan, uh, sell one to Frankie, and told Juan, and Juan, you know, as as his as his mentor slash techno daddy. <laughs> said boy what's wrong with you why are you gonna do that <laughs> you can just yeah. gonna get rid of your sound like that um, just like that i'm gonna ask a couple <laughs> more questions this one's from ryan um how did you perceive the architecture of techno clubs uh affected the sound and progression of the genre back in the day this is also uh, you know something i know we talked about carl um and do, do these spaces and maybe the residents of the industrial spaces um how do they play within the music sort of a open yeah, question the um the spaces had had uh, um, a lot of impact because these were places that we probably would have never gone into you know i didn't i didn't uh promote any warehouse parties or any anything yeah, like yeah, that yeah. but i did play at at a few at the packer plant and it was, you know, vast and wondrous and, and you know, dilapidated and crazy, but um, uh, it helped to uh, nurture the culture of rave uh, culture in, in, uh, in the 90s that was really important for Detroit to have, you know, because clubs were, were real strange in Detroit. Um, we had one club that, that, uh, uh, the DJ there, Reg, I can't DJ Reggie. I can't remember what his last name was, but he used to play um, ballroom blitz and and uh, and Smiths and all that stuff. And then at twelve o'clock, he started playing Chicago tracks mm -hmm. records and and Detroit techno records. And and I started seeing more people uh, that I knew from high school, more black people coming in. And then the week after, there was a no house music rule that happened that they were promoting and i knew exactly what that said you know that was saying that there were too many black people that are coming out they didn't want any black people coming into these kind of clubs so the rave world opened it up outside of the music institute which was um uh the club that Derek may and kevin saunderson and, and uh, juan atkins played and actually the music institute was a direct influence from frankie knuckles warehouse and from uh larry levan at the at um 
uh, shoot, I can't remember what the name of, of the garage, right? <laughs> the garage, Paradise Garage. Mm-hmm. So, um, so these raves made it where, you know, it was this high power music that mm-hmm. um, that became more uh, of an integrated crowd mm-hmm. uh, that that could be seen. Maybe we can end by talking a little bit about the Music Institute. Um, you know, as a place of sort of gathering, but thinking um, is really dedicated to the form in, in various ways, right? Um, do, you, do you find that that exists today? Is there a music institute or is there a need for one rather? Oh, there's um, such a need for a music institute. There's a need for a Paradise maybe. Garage. There's a need for, for a, a music box. Maybe we can share, I mean, for those that are listening a little bit more about the Music Institute, I know DeForest and Carl, you know quite a bit. Yeah. Um, we can give people the, the energy to make it. Um, within, within the house music world um, in New York, when people go to see Timmy Regisford DJ, they would refer to it as going to church. And that's what the Music Institute was for us. It was like the church, the library, the party, uh, uh, the the um, the dance, the dance studio. It was like it was everything for uh, people of my age group that really really needed it. You know, they needed something that was going to play this new cutting edge music and um, have people that are, you know, willing and able to do everything that they can in order, in order to hear, hear the music. The Music Institute was great for women. I mean, there were beautiful women there and stuff, but it wasn't a meat market. Like when you go to a club and, you know, most of the guys there are just there for drinking and, and the girls, you know, the Music Institute was like, when you went to the Music Institute, you knew everybody in that club, at least 80% of the people in that club were there for the music. And that that was important. And, and I don't think you can can really touch that with a stick. Mm-hmm. Uh, now yeah, I, really like, I really like the programming from what I've read of the Music Institute, how there was the Back to Basics night, and then I guess another night of faster new generation music. Would, and, uh, would Derek play the second night, I guess? Now the first night was was Derek's night, which is Friday. Okay. The second night was with Shea Damier and mm-hmm. uh, and Alton Miller. So that was the Back to Basics one. So Back to Basics was was really them uh, a tribute to uh, Frankie and Larry. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I heard. No. Yeah. Which which Larry Carl? Uh, Larry Levan. Larry Levan. Okay. Um, well, I guess not Larry. Anything- we have a couple more minutes, but I think if um, I, I can take a couple more questions, um, but I wanted to ask DeForest if you have any last thoughts as well. Hmm. Well, I mean, we've certainly learned a lot, right? Is that across, what would you say, like the 30, 40 years that techno has kind of been in existence, there's been a lot that has been done both musically by the original pioneers, but also by the industry that is, um, we'll say, built up an entire institution on top of this music, right? And so it's really nice to come together at in 2020 with a pioneer of this music and kind of try to suss out the middle ground. I, I think it's really significant that this conversation would happen at a place like Dia. As Carl said, that there's there's a real need for the music box, there's a real need for the Music Institute. And party after party seems to be a nice occasion to kind of like pull all of this together. I mean, mm-hmm. is that something that you were thinking about, Carl? I mean, was this is it, your idea? Right. Well, well, the the installation is is um, all of my experiences from traveling, from going to clubs all around the world. So there is a bit of music institute. There is a bit of music box. There's I haven't been to the warehouse, so I, I couldn't say or the Paradise Garage, so I couldn't say. But you know, um, there's uh, Yellow in Tokyo. There's um, uh, like I said, Panorama Bar and and Plastic People in London and and there's all these these influences that are there. But you know the the Music Institute was really my prime 
experiences uh, and maybe the best experiences musically that I had uh, in, in, a, in a venue. Um, so that definitely is in, in my piece at DIA. Um, We're missing those venues right now. Hopefully soon we'll be able to be within them again. Um, but thank you both so much. This is fantastic. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, thank you, thank DeForest. You. And thank you for everyone that's joined us um, for the great questions. And I wish everyone a fantastic weekend. Cheers. Take care. Goodbye.